Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is Monday, March 8th, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, $1.9 trillion mayhem. And I'm not going to do any type of deep dive into this monstrosity that has already been passed by the Senate, very likely going to be passed by the House of Representatives tomorrow, and it's just a question of time until President Biden signs it into law, and then we're going to have the $1,400 stimulus checks come out and all this other garbage making its way through the entire system. Now, if you want to sort of do the deeper dive or play the politics into it, turn on any news station. That's what they're all going to talk about. Obviously, the Democrats are going to praise it. Hell, it is one of the best things ever, and the Republicans are going to criticize it. And what's, of course, true about this is anything that the Republicans call out as being ridiculous because it's something that the Democrats want to push through. Yeah, it is ridiculous. Just like if the rules were reversed and you had Democrats ridiculing the Republicans, yeah, they would be right too. Don't you understand this is all political theater? This is all a circus? This is all about divide and conquer? Nowhere do they really ever talk about the perspective of how much spending this is, which is what I'm going to do here today. Put this into perspective. This is all insanity, what they're getting away with. And it, you know, it's, it, it really boggles the mind, but it doesn't when you understand the hypocrisy of politics and politicians, when you obviously have Republicans out there now crying foul that they are concerned about future prosperity, they are concerned about saddling younger generations with all of this debt, that they, you know, they don't, they're not here to vote for this. How can they be responsible for this? Blah, 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 blah. They didn't care about the Nobody Cares Act 1.0, 2.2 trillion. They didn't care about Nobody Cares Act 2.0, 900 billion. They didn't stop when that was joint at the hip of a spending bill of 1.4 trillion. They weren't concerned about that before. Why was that? Oh, that's right. They were the ones in power. They were the ones in power. Now they want to say, oh, this 1.9 trillion piece of crap, which it is, Oh, it's, this is just the wish list for Democrats. Oh, because Republicans don't ever have a wish list. They don't have special interests or lobbyists or anybody else that they cater to. Oh, no, that's just the Democrats. Don't be stupid. These people do not care about you. They do not care about you. They do not care about you. They don't deserve your vote. They don't deserve your respect. Do not give it to them. Leave them immediately if you haven't done so already. I have 28 trillion pieces of evidence. You got nothing. You have your feelings. Okay, it's nice to have your feelings. I don't care. I care about math. I care about economics. I care about the finance of all of it. I care about the political philosophy of it. The reality of it. Your feelings don't come into that. Sorry, they don't. Because none of it works. Because we didn't accumulate. We did not amass $28 trillion in a national debt just because of the Republicans or just because of the Democrats. And when you look at the unfunded liabilities, you want to talk about future prosperity and giving a damn about young people in, in future generations. No, give me a break. That dwarfs it by a multiple. Okay? So what we'll do is a deeper dive. Just And it's not even that deep. It's just looking at how much spending we are going through. And remember, this has only been a year. It's only been a year. This is the one-year anniversary of the lockdowns and the restrictions, and we still have initial jobless claims coming in over 700,000. And I like to have conversations that put all of this stuff into context because it's obviously very important. Some of you are very familiar with these numbers. Some of you are not. So when I rattle off numbers, you say, okay, well, that sounds like a big number. That sounds bad. But what was that number last year? What was that figure five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and it's important to see that because you want to see that rate of change. You want to see those year-over-year -year changes. How destructive is it, or is it something that's tolerable? Well, unfortunately, most of what we're witnessing is not tolerable, it is not sustainable, and it is putting us on the path to destruction. And it gives me great concern with how much bigger and more involved the government is getting for what happens on the other side of this when the dust settles. I'm an optimistic person by nature. I say this all the time. I think once the dust settles, if we evaluate correctly 
And if we implement the right policies, our best days can be ahead of us. But I have great concern because a lot of younger people really buy in to the belief that it's the role of government to get heavily involved in every facet of the economy, in society. That is destructive. That is not the recipe for success. That is the recipe for disaster. This has been proven time and time again. Again, another definition of insanity. So that's what gives me concern on top of all of this other stuff that we are doing, which sort of seals the fate that this is not going to end well. And of course, we did a series of podcasts last year giving a history lesson, what we're doing now versus what we did during the Great Depression, what really caused the Great Depression. And it's all of this government involvement, pulling on all of the levers, thinking that they know best, trying to be well-intentioned, and it collapses. You have to allow the markets to do what markets do best. That is find equilibrium. You have to allow prices to do what they do. And that is find equilibrium. That is allowing markets to clear. That's what's supposed to happen. Instead, what we have done and continue to do with no end in sight now is continue to flood the markets with liquidity, with more money that we don't have, that we're borrowing and printing into existence, that is not free, that is going to be more expensive than ever. Not just here in this country, because inflation has a passport to every country. It's going to go everywhere. We are already witnessing that. The weakest links are collapsing first. We have, you know, some other countries right now, like Brazil, for example. A lot of movement right now in the currency markets because the dollar has been strengthening. You know, you start to see this collapse in emerging markets. This is not going to end well for anybody. And of course, we've been discussing this for the past couple of years. These things do not happen overnight. They take time. And when you have a global concerted effort of flooding the system with trillions of dollars, euros, yen, yuan, etc., you're going to buy yourself some time. Okay, so you can make things appear to be real when really they're not. This is a magic trick. And it's an experiment also. It's one of the largest economic experiments that's ever been placed upon mankind. Okay, as far as we know, I don't know how to read hieroglyphs, but as far as I know, this is the largest economic experiment that has ever been tried. And I just don't think it's going to end well because it is being tried and implemented by the same people who have led us into one crisis after the next. I don't think this time they finally solved it. I don't think that's going to be the case. So those are some of the concerns, but I want to bring things back into perspective because I think that's very important. We're going to do that. So last night was obviously Sunday, and I did a markets overnight uh, segment because of what was taking place in the oil market. And we were seeing WTI at prices we haven't seen since 2018 and Brent prices, something we haven't seen since 2019. And so it was just uh, at the topic of discussion to see how things would translate into the day session once the U.S. markets opened up. And we'll get to that. But we have the dollar index at 92 spot 34, 92 spot 34. So that gained from last night's discussion. Uh, we have the euro to the dollar at $1.18. We have the British pound to the dollar at $1.38. The Aussie to the dollar at 76 cents. The New Zealand Kiwi to the dollar at 71 cents. So there's been some volatility in these major currency pairs. It was just a few short weeks ago where Pretty much all of those major currencies were a few cents stronger against the dollar, and a few pennies is a big move. And that is why that is cause for concern with respect to a lot of emerging markets, because they are saddled with a lot of U.S. dollar-denominated debt, and that will just simply mean more resources that those countries are going to have to use to pay off their debts as opposed to reinvesting it back into their countries, which is the same conversation we had yesterday when we said just the slightest increase to interest rates will cause Uncle Sam's borrowing costs to go up drastically. And so all the production that we have here in this country is now a lot of that is going to have to be used to pay off debt as opposed to being invested back into the country. So as I've been saying here time and time again, you can have compounding interest work for you or you can have it work against you. And what we have adopted due to political expediency, well... We're having compounding interest work against us. And that's why central banks, because it's not just the United States that's running into this problem, it's everywhere. And that's why you have central banks panicking. You have them concerned. 
with increasing yields in their bond markets. That's their borrowing costs. This bubble is extremely fragile. It's not going to take that high of an interest rate of a yield on the 10-year, on the 30-year bond here in the U.S. to prick this thing. And if it just keeps, if the yields keep going up, despite what governments and central bankers do, that's when we know that the markets have said enough is enough. And that's it. And what's going to happen is markets are going to do what they're going to do. They are going to clean house. It is going to be painful. It is going to be brutal. But this is what happens when you have no leadership, no responsibility, no accountability in Congress, at the ECB, in China, in Japan, in Australia, around the globe. But this is what you get when you vote for these people who don't care about you. And this is what you get when you allow these people to print money, beg for money, borrow money into existence. This is what happens. Okay? It can look good for some people, but for the majority of people, it is not going to be a good thing. On the share price front, we have, oh, this is overnight, we have the Dow Jones Industrial Average up six-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 is up about eight-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 is up 1.2%. And earlier in the day session, it was a wild ride. You had one of the biggest disconnects between the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ today. I think the biggest disconnect since about 1993, where you had the Dow Jones rallying today, hitting uh, an intraday all-time high, and you had the NASDAQ giving back a couple percentage points. Okay, and now obviously the concern here with the tech sector is this increase in yields. And then obviously the argument that is being pushed out there as to why you saw the Dow go up and you're seeing some of the small caps go up is because there is this rotation out of growth into value. Yeah, there might be some truth to that. I'm, I'm just calling this another narrative play. That's all it is. As far as I'm concerned, this is just another narrative because I saw a, an interesting headline out of Yahoo Finance today shaking my head where it said, well, increasing yields are actually good for stocks. I mean, what is bad for stocks? Uh, low interest rates are great for stocks. High interest rates now are great for stocks. Pandemics and lockdowns and restrictions are great for stocks. Vaccines and uh, removing those pandemic restrictions and lockdowns are great for stocks. Is there anything that isn't? I mean, th this is bizarre world. Th this is why markets are busted. They're broken. And I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I think GameStop was up another 40% or something today. Okay, because that's what happens. That's what happens in a free market capitalistic system. You have this type of insanity. No, no, you don't. This is what happens when you live in a banana republic. This is what you witness, okay? And it's, this isn't going to end until it does, okay? And that's when the music stop pl stops playing. That's when the markets call BS. Enough of this, can't handle it anymore. And there are going to be constraints. And nobody knows that number. But that's a question that needs to be asked of Jay Powell and company at the Fed. That's what needs to be asked of Christine Lagarde at the ECB and other central bank heads. What's the constraints? What are the limits to these policies? How much further can you go? They'll never answer that. Because if that number ever gets hit, well, now they have to be held to account. Which, of course, never happens anyway at least ask the question, get the conversation going. And if you don't seem to care about the size of the deficit, then why do we have to pay taxes? That's another very basic, commonsensical question to ask these people too, which is going to be part of our discussion as we talk about the perspective with all of the money that we are spending. So a sea of green across the pond in Europe. Biggest gainer was the German markets up three and a third percent, followed by the Italian exchanges up three 0.1%. And a lot of this is off of the narrative that, well, Congress is passing the $1.9 trillion monstrosity. Yay for everybody. Everybody benefits when the U.S. spends money we don't have. Ain't that great? Australian cash trade is up one half of 1%. Chinese stocks continue their decline, giving back four tenths of 1%. At the share price, let's look at Apple giving back 4%. Tesla giving back 5.8%, trading at $563 a share. Uh, I think over 30% down from its all-time high. Microsoft down 1.8%. Amazon down 1.6%. Facebook down three and a third. Let's see who is some of the bigger gainers today. Or financial stocks: Visa up two and a quarter. J.P. Morgan up one and a third. And Goldman Sachs gaining two percent for the day. So some people would argue 
that the financial sector, because of increasing yields, gives them more cushion, is better for them, yada, yada, yada. Maybe that plays out. Time will tell. WTI is trading at $65.22, so well below where we were last night. Brent at $68.50, so again, below where we were last night, which was closer to 70, gaining near $71. Natural gas, $2.65. Gold and silver hanging on. Gold, $1,688 an ounce. Silver at $25.34 an ounce. And copper hanging on $4.08 a pound. Rounded out, Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note is yielding 1.57%, so little changed from the overnight session that we discussed. And then, of course, we have our Treasury Secretary, Janet Dingbat Yellen, coming out and saying, well, she doesn't see inflation. You know, this woman couldn't hit water if she fell out of a boat. She didn't see the housing crisis either. She, you know, she said a couple years ago, oh, there's never going to be another financial crisis, uh, you know, as, as long as she lives or, in, or you know, in history. It's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, Janet, uh, Ms. Dingbat, wh why did we throw trillions of dollars into the system then if we didn't have some sort of financial crisis? W weren't things just moving along swimmingly well? I isn't that right? No, of course these people will never never admit to any mistakes. They will never take any type of responsibility. So she sees no inflation, which means that it's here and it's coming and it's only going to get worse. And now we have India, the country of India, asking OPEC plus. So the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, plus a couple of others, Russia being the biggest one, saying, can you please, can you Pretty please, increase production. Now, why do you think the Indians want production to go up with respect to oil? Because they want the prices to come down. But why? Whoa, no, whoa. Oh, hey, ho. Oh. Didn't they get the memo? Didn't they listen to Dingbat? She said there is no inflation and it's not going to be a problem. Didn't they listen to Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, and all of his buddies at the Fed? Haven't they all come out and said, this is nothing to be worried about, nothing to be concerned about? We can contain it. We can crush it. There is no inflation. But why are the Indians concerned about this? All because they know it's here. They know it's coming. They know it's going to get worse. And of course, India has a whole slew of political problems too. They still have the farmers protesting. They are a major importer of crude oil. You see where this is going? This is not going to end well at all. Okay? This is just getting started. So the, the narrative here in the United States from our fearless leaders is there is no inflation. Don't worry about it. And if yields go up, that's okay. That's a, that's a sign of growth. It's, that's all it is. It's just a sign of growth, and everybody should be happy about it. But here's some perspective that I hope you find interesting because I was curious to know what this was myself. So you have Nobody Cares Act 1.0 last year, about $2.2 trillion. All right. Where does that stand alone? $2.2 trillion. That would take you between the GDP, between France and Italy. France is at $2.7 trillion. Italy is at $2 trillion. So the Nobody Cares Act by itself would be one of the largest economies on the planet. Just Nobody Cares Act 1.0. Then you go to Nobody Cares Act 2.0, that $900 billion. That takes you down to the GDP of the Netherlands, which is still a top 20 economy by GDP on this planet. Okay? Then you had the Nobody Cares Act 2.0, the $900 billion piece of crap, tied or joined to the hip of the $1.4 trillion spending bill just to keep the lights on if memory serves me correctly, through the first quarter of this year, which is coming to an end in a few weeks, which begs the question, what are we going to do when that ends? Are they going to have to spend another $1.4 trillion to get us through the second quarter? What are they going to do? So, nonetheless, $1.4 trillion. Where does that take us to? That takes us basically a tie between Spain and Australia. So you get to pick which vacation you want to go on, if you're allowed to go, you might have to get a passport, a special passport that says you're vaccinated, you're clean, you can go because this is the world we live in now. This is a brave new world. This is 1984, okay? But nonetheless, you pick. It's a difference between Spain 
in Australia, both about 1.4 trillion economies. I'd personally rather go to Spain, but that's me. But nonetheless, there you go. Again, another top 20 economy around the globe. Now we come to this piece of junk that just passed the Senate. It's going to pass the House this week. President Biden will sign it into law. 1.9 trillion. So that takes us to Italy. It takes us between Italy and Brazil. Brazil is at 1.8 trillion in change. Again, you're in the top 10 economies on the planet. That's how much we have just spent in one year. That's how much we've approved in one year's time. This is ridiculous, and this doesn't count. This does not count what we already spend on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, national defense, war, whatever you want to call it, and interest on our debt, plus all of the other transfer payment programs, plus all of the other departments of the federal government. Subsidies, corporate welfare, social welfare. What does this give us? This gives us a grand total. The Nobody Cares Act, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and the spending bill, just the, just the typical spending bill, again, the $1.4 trillion. This gives us a total of $6.4 trillion. $6.4 trillion. And we have nothing to show for it, but $6.4 trillion. Where does that put us? If this was a standalone economy, we would be the third largest economy on the planet. The United States, China, and then all of the spending that we have just approved in one year's time at $6.4 trillion. We would be surpassing that of Japan by over a trillion dollars, by about $1.4 trillion, actually. That's how crazy all of this is. It's hard to fathom, isn't it, when you put it in this light, when you put it in this perspective. So $6.4 trillion also comes out to almost two years worth, two full years worth of federal government revenue. Of course, that's called taxation, which we're right at about $3.5 trillion. So if you said we brought in $3.5 trillion last year and we're expected to bring in about the same this year, that's $7 trillion. So a difference of some $600 billion, that's jump change. That's about the size of TARP. Remember TARP, the Troubled Asset Re, uh, Relief Program? So that was $700 billion, and that was supposedly enough 12 years ago, 13 years ago, to save the economy, save the country, and to save the financial system. $700 billion 13 years ago. Now we're at $6.4 trillion, and we ain't done. $700 billion just doesn't buy you what it used to, folks. This is 10 times the amount in a little over a decade. Do you get how ridiculous, how insane this is? Do you understand why we are a banana republic? This is what you expect them to do in Argentina, in Turkey, in Iran, in Venezuela, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Zimbabwe. Now you have to throw the United States into that mix with other countries, too developed countries, supposedly developed, doesn't appear to be that developed with this type of thinking, but nonetheless, this is what we're doing. So all of that spending, $6.4 trillion, just an additional spending, $6.4 trillion would make us the third largest economy in and of itself. I mean, hell, just what we bring in in taxation would make us like the fifth largest right behind Germany. So this is what you're getting. This is what you're paying for. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to break it down for you here, too, just so you have the numbers. A little refresher, because we talk about this from time to time. USDebtClock.org. Medicare, Medicaid spending, 1.2, almost 1.3 trillion. Social Security is at 1.1 trillion. Defense slash war is at 722 billion. And the interest on our debt, our net payments, come out to about 395 billion. And if you just take those numbers, that already puts us into a deficit to begin with. And I don't want to hear it again, as I stated at the top of this podcast, I don't want to hear it from Republicans either. Because we had trillion dollar deficits before COVID-19 when the Republicans were in charge. Okay? So I don't want to hear it. 
You have no leg to stand on. You want to be a hypocrite, that's fine. That's your business, but that's what you're going to be. Just understand this. You got nothing for it. Absolutely nothing. You got a, a, a short shot of adrenaline. That's all it was. Made things look better than what they actually were, only to get wiped out immediately, which would have likely have happened anyway. Okay, with or without this pandemic. The pandemic just gives these idiots all of the cover they need to spend $6.4 trillion that we don't have to do absolutely nothing. Just filling the hole. No infrastructure. No jobs training or reskilling. Nothing. Nothing of the investment kind. Just flood the system. Create winners and losers. Pick winners and losers. Determine who is a necessity or an essential worker and who is not. So if you're a small business owner, you're screwed for the most part, even if you sell the same goods or offer the same services as a larger corporation, even if you did what the government, the CDC, what everybody and their mother told you to do to remain open, they shut you down again. And then, of course, the other head scratcher with what we continue to witness in initial jobless claims and not a so good, uh, not a good jobs report that came out for the month of February last Friday either. If, if all of these programs of the Nobody Cares Act 1.0, 2.0, and blah, 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 if they were so good, the PPP loans, then why do we continue to see this amount of unemployment and underemployment and people filing these claims? Isn't that what the PPP and all of this crap was passed to prevent from happening? You take the loans and you can stay in business and you keep all of your employees on the payroll. If you had already laid them off, bring them back. Because if you bring them back and you keep all of your employees on payroll, well, guess what? Those PPP loans now turn into grants, which means you don't have to pay them back. So why are all these people still being laid off? Doesn't make any sense until you understand why I call it the Nobody Cares Act, because that's not where the money's going, folks. They are ripping us off. They are picking winners and losers. We know where the money's going. When you have, you know, the top 50 people in the world getting uh, another trillion dollars richer. When you have tens of millions of people unemployed just in this country alone, in food bank lines, in eviction lines. We haven't even dealt with that yet. It just doesn't seem right. Something is amiss. Oh, but I'm a Democrat. These people love me. They look out for the little guy. Or I'm a Republican. I'm conservative. I care about the law and fiscal responsibility. You can shove it. You have no leg to stand on. None. Whatsoever. Leave these parties immediately and hold these people to account. They give you nothing but reasons to do so. Hold their feet to the fire. Hold them to account. Do not support these people. Not a one of them. They don't do anything for you. 96 to nothing, no votes for America. Have you forgotten? I'm going to make sure you don't. This is important stuff. $1.9 trillion mayhem. Just getting started. So I hope this makes sense. I hope this has put things into perspective for you. This is how much money we are spending. This is ridiculous. We are getting nothing for it, except inflation and the destruction that's going to come from it. Other countries know it. They're already experiencing it. Just like I've been saying for the past couple of years, protests, riots, revolutions, everything. You think it can't happen here? It can and it will. Hopefully it's for the better, but there's going to be a lot of mayhem before the dust settles. And we can only hope and pray that the right policies are enacted on the other side. And as every day goes by, I am becoming, unfortunately, more skeptical of that being the case. So educate people as much as you can, turn them on to the Capitol News as much as you can, and other programs like this that have some common sense and understand economics and can connect the dots. And basically a political atheist. I don't care about this two-party system that's really one-party system that's screwing us all over. You have to rise above this. You have to stop falling for the crazy divide and conquer antics that is perpetuated on Fox and CNN and MSNBC. You have to wake up and you got to do it now. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.